a truly unique experience to be able to introduce our, our next presenter. Um, don't cheat by looking ahead in the program. Um, but <laughs> placemaking takes vision, collaboration, strategy, investment, commitment, and persistence, and public and private sectors working together. The heart and soul of a community, what makes it unique and authentic place is often already in place, but many need a bit of coaxing to be revealed. And often all it takes is one local leader to move the mark forward. Our next speaker is East Lansing's mayor, Nathan Triplett, who is one of those individuals who's working as a catalyst, not only for change in his own community, but inspiring his municipal colleagues across the state to embrace arts, culture, and creativity as a tool to create vibrant communities. And no, I'm not just saying that because I'm his wife. So I'd like to ask you to please uh, give a warm welcome to the mayor of East Lansing, Nathan Triplett. working? Everyone can hear me all right? Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you all here this morning. This is the part where I scare you to death by saying I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So um, just by a show of hands, how many of you who have been doing this type of creative placemaking work in the past have had a bad experience with municipal government, some kind of negative experience with municipal government? All right, so a few of you. Um, you know, this is a relatively new area for a lot of municipal leaders and it can be very uncomfortable. In fact, I was sharing with some folks earlier when we were having uh, breakfast this morning that uh, this is a rare treat for me to be able to come to an event like this and talk about creative placemaking work because right now I'm spending a lot of time on the road talking about things that are a lot more bread and butter for municipal government. Most of you probably know we'll be deciding on a ballot measure here in Michigan in May that's all about funding roads in Michigan. Uh, and so we're talking a lot about safety and streets and roads and infrastructure. Uh, and that's what people typically think of when they think about local government uh, and municipal government in particular. But uh, what we're increasingly recognizing is that there's a lot more to the work of local government and that this work is actually essential. Alice actually made reference earlier uh, to the soul of the community research that's been, been done by the Knight Foundation. And if any of you haven't taken the opportunity to read that study, I would highly recommend it because it really puts the kind of work that we're doing in context. It talks about how the attachment, the emotional attachment that individuals feel to their community is actually a driver of economic growth. It's not the things that you would expect. It's not jobs, it's not education, it's not infrastructure. Those aren't the things that people prioritize when they think about attachment to their communities. It's things that are a lot more intangible and specifically across the three years of the research, what it shows is that there are three things consistently that top out as what's attaching folks to their community. Social offerings, openness, and aesthetics. And that's where creative placemaking really comes in because across those categories, what we see time and time again is arts and cultural opportunities are one of the key things that attach people to their communities and that helps drive economic growth. So while municipal leaders will always be focused on things like police and fire protection, roads, bridges, infrastructure, parks. Increasingly, we're recognizing that ensuring there are opportunities uh, for arts and culture in the community is important as we compete in this pitched battle to attract and retain the very best talent in our communities across the state. So I think it's important uh, when you look at that research from the Knight Foundation to ask, what does that tell us? Or more importantly, what does it tell people like me who are sitting in city council chambers or at township boards of trustees across the state of Michigan and how can you approach them when you're talking about doing important creative placemaking work? And what it should tell them when they look at the research is that creative placemaking and specifically public art, arts and culture uh, is not frivolous, it's not an indulgence, it's not an extra, it's core to the work that we're doing to create the kind of communities that can attract and retain talent. Um, this morning, for the few minutes I have before we take some questions, I want to focus on one very small segment of that creative placemaking work and what we've done in the city of East Lansing, and that's on public art. Uh, because this is an area where we've really had a lot of focus in recent years, and I think it's a good example of where, rather than being an impediment to creative placemaking, municipalities can actually lead and help support the work that many of your nonprofit arts and culture organizations are doing and build a strong partnership. So, I think uh, it's natural for folks to ask the question, especially uh, when we're facing all these different budget pressures at the time, why, why does this matter? Why does creative placemaking matter? Why does public art specifically matter? You wouldn't believe the number of times, well, this group might actually uh, believe the number of times people ask, how can we afford to do that? 
with every pressure we have right now, with our roads crumbling, with cuts to state shared revenue, how can we afford to spend money on public art? And I would submit to you that we're asking the wrong question. If that's the question we're asking, we're missing the point. The question should be, how can we afford not to do this work in our communities? How can we afford not to make public art a central component of what local governments are doing to create that sense of place? And why is that? It's because public art helps break the trend of blandness and sameness that plagues communities across our country, and particularly, let's be frank, in the Midwest. All of us have had the experience of going from community to community and looking around at a strip mall and saying, I could be anywhere in the United States. There's nothing about this place that tells me I'm in East Lansing, Michigan, or Ypsilanti, Michigan, or Traverse City, Michigan. It's just the same strip mall over and over again. That's not the kind of environment, that's not the kind of uniqueness that tells people, this is where I want to live. This is where I want to stay. This is where I want to invest my money. This is where I want to start a business. And public art can help break that trend by making something unique. If you come into the city of East Lansing now and you drive down Abbott Road, you'll see a 16-foot tall, beautiful red sculpture honoring one of our former city council members named Mary Sharp, who, among other things, fought the battle to pass the first ordinance in the United States banning discrimination based on sexual orientation. We have a sculpture honoring her that not only highlights uh, that historic commitment to our community, but will become emblematic of East Lansing. You'll always know when you see that sculpture, you're in downtown East Lansing. It's the same kind of experience you have in Chicago when you go to Millennium Park and you see the Cloud Gate or the Bean. That's become synonymous with the city of Chicago and it has everything to do with helping know that you're in a unique place. Additionally, cities can gain cultural, social, and economic value from investments in public art. We think about the value that we gain from having high quality public services, but municipal officials are often quick to dismiss the more intangible or more attenuated benefits that you can get from public art, but I can assure you, in a community like ours that's heavily invested in this, we see the benefits each and every day. It might be more difficult uh, to parse out. It might be uncomfortable at times for municipal officials to see those benefits, but each and every day, our focus on public art helps bring in cultural economic development dollars, it helps support local cu uh, cultural organizations, and encourages people to locate in my community when they're trying to decide, should I be in Columbus, or Madison, or Chicago, or here in Ann Arbor, or East Lansing. Perhaps more importantly, uh, public art also helps humanize the built environment. One of the real challenges we have in urban planning today in municipal government is that we tend to focus on the value for the dollar and not think about how human beings actually interact in any given space. We think about how to park cars, how to move traffic, but not how will I as an individual, as a citizen, work through this environment uh, to be able to interact with that space. Public art helps break that trend and give people a way to interact with things on a human level. And finally, public art helps promote civic engagement. Uh, and before I talk a little bit about the public policy piece of this, I want to share with you an anecdote. You know, one of the things about public art is that it doesn't have to be, and oftentimes we default to this, it doesn't have to be something that everyone likes. It doesn't have to be something where we regress to the mean and say, public art is about being pretty, it's about not being challenging. It's about making sure that everyone is happy with it. Quite the contrary. Public art can be something that challenges people and forces conversation. So, yeah, I'm glad someone agrees. So let me tell you one brief story about that. East Lansing is very proud to be the home of the Eli and Edith Broad uh, Art Museum right in our downtown. And because of that cultural asset, we have access to artists of a global caliber. And we had a very rare opportunity. A Pakistani artist named Imram Qureshi who uh, has previously done major installations on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, at the Sharjah Biennial, uh, and elsewhere, was coming to the Broad to do an exhibition. And while the museum staff was pitching uh, this exhibit to the city and letting us know it was coming, they showed us a picture of the roof of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he had painted a beautiful uh, installation that essentially, up close, looked like beautiful floral prints of miniature, but from a distance looked like some horrific uh, attack had happened. It was actually inspired, he does these pieces inspired by a terrorist attack that he experienced as a young man in Lahore, Pakistan. And my initial reaction to seeing that work was, can I have one of those in East Lansing? And believe it or not, this artist of global import said, absolutely, let's do that. He came to East Lansing, he did an exhibition across our downtown, and I will tell you, um, not everyone was happy about that. <laughs> 
but it's still there and I'd highly recommend that you come see it. But here's the important part. If you sit on the patio of any of our restaurants downtown and you see this painting on the sidewalk, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, not one person will walk by and not stop and not, not start a conversation with the person they're walking with and talk about that installation. It has done everything, everything that you would want from a piece of public art. It's brought people to our downtown, it's engaged them in conversation, it's encouraged them to interact with their fellow residents and citizens in a new way, and that's something that adds vitality to our community. So that's the general case. What's important about public art? Those are some of the general pieces. What can local units of government do to really revitalize that and take bold action to support public art? I wanna briefly talk about uh, two pieces. First and foremost, I'm very proud uh, that at the moment East Lansing is the only municipality in the state of Michigan to have an active percent for art public art requirement. Uh, this is something that our Arts Commission and our residents worked very hard for over a period of months, and let me give you the rough outline of how we've approached this. We recognize, uh, as was already pointed out very aptly in Alice's presentation, that uh, investment in these things is an issue that we are pressed hard for resources and we need to be able to find the money. And so we wanted to make sure that both the community and private enterprise had skin in the game when it came to investing in public art. So our percent for art ordinance has both a public and a private component. On the public side, we've committed to take 1% of every dollar or, uh, spent on capital improvements and public facilities and allocate it into the city's public art fund with no cap, 1% of every dollar from the general fund for public improvements straight into the public art fund to fund projects in our community to help support public art on the public side. On the private side, thank you. On the private side in East Lansing, recognizing that again, this is all about humanizing the built environment and creating a positive aesthetic in our community and that has a lot to do with the development that happens. On the private side, we've created an ordinance that requires that 1% of the total cost of construction for any project that's built in the city of East Lansing in excess of $500,000 uh, must be spent on public art. And we give the developers three options for how to do that. They can cut a check and send it right to the public art fund where our arts commission will allocate it. They can incorporate the artwork into their project themselves with the assistance of our arts commission or they can do some combination thereof. But no matter what, if you're building a project in East Lansing that's over $500,000 in value, and if it's a residential project, it has more than four units, then you're gonna be required to incorporate public art into that project or to otherwise provide money so that the community can do it for you. Making sure that everyone recognizes that this kind of aesthetic support uh, to create public art, a lasting public art system in our community, is a priority, and we're willing to back that up, not just with requests, uh, not just with suggestions, but saying, this is the law in East Lansing. It is a priority and it will be involved in every project. Now I should note that uh, for those of you who are interested in pursuing a policy like this elsewhere, um, it can be controversial. There's no denying that. And to be completely honest, uh, compromises are necessary. So I wanna flag a couple of those for you very quickly. There is a cap on the private investment piece uh, for our proposal. No developer will be asked to spend more than $25,000 on uh, public art for any given project. I'll be completely honest with you, I'm not thrilled with that cap, but it was a political necessity to get the project through and I hope someday to remove it. Uh, but right now, to give you an idea of what kind of revenue this is gonna generate for our community, if this proposal uh, had been in place last year for our development, the public art fund from the private sector would have generated over $75,000 available just in that year for the support of public artwork in addition to $10,000 from the public component as well. So in one year, $85,000 available to be able to support public artwork in our community. I think it's a powerful statement about our values as a city and a good example of, about how local units of government, municipal leaders can help facilitate creative placemaking and public art rather than be an impediment to that. Um, very quickly, one last piece. I know there was reference made earlier today and this is what I hear from a lot of people that the real issue with local government being involved in creative placemaking is actually that we tend to over-regulate and get in the way. When I ask people, what can local government do to help creative placemaking, the answer I normally get is get out of the way. Stop causing a problem. Um, I acknowledge that and it's true. Um, and I think East Lansing is a good example of the kind of orientation that you can have or encourage your local officials to have to uh, get through that. The Koreshi exhibit is a great example, but we've also pursued other pieces. And in a different uh, part of her life, I wanna give credit to my wife, Sarah, who also happens to be the chair of the East Lansing Arts Commission. 
but they've helped pass through policies uh, that has made it easier for people to let folks encounter art in their daily life every day. Rather than install regular inverse U bike racks in East Lansing, we're making sure that those are artistic bike racks that are actually each mini pieces of artistic sculpture. So walking down Grand River Avenue, you're not just seeing the same old ordinary inverted black U, you're seeing something that looks like the city seal. Or my personal favorite is one that looks like a, uh, a gas station pump, except with zero dollars on it, implying that you can bike without having to spend money on gas. Um, we do that kind of work all over the city. Or a more recent example is the adoption of our urban mural project, affectionately known as Crack Art. It's a little provocative, uh, and it, it's caused some controversy at times, but this allows artists in the community to fast track any approval process on any public space. They can come in and put forward a proposal. If you want to paint a group of ants climbing up a crack, making it look like a hill on a sidewalk, so someone walking along encounters it, you can do that. If you want to paint a mini mural on the side of the uh, berm at City Hall, you can do that. And we streamline the process so it's not costly, it's not time consuming, and we're not getting in the way of that kind of creative expression. A real opportunity to tell people that this is something we value and that that kind of uh, unique aesthetic environment, that kind of beauty, is more important than making sure that we have a rule for everything and that every T is crossed and every I is dotted, but giving people some room to let those creative juices flow and really invest in our community. So those are just a couple examples, I think, of how municipal leaders, if they recognize this is not um, something that is secondary, it's not something that's frivolous, but is actually core to the work that our communities do, uh, can help prosper. So before I take some questions, as Deb mentioned, unfortunately, I'm not able to stay for uh, the later question period, and I'd love to hear any questions that you folks have. Uh, I want to say, in summary, that public art is one of those things where when you hear the question, uh, how can we afford to do this? I would encourage you to push back. Use some of this information and say and point to other examples. This is something we can't afford not to do. Uh, when you hear people say, well, we have this code or this ordinance or this policy, you've got to encourage people to break those barriers down and get in there and recognize the overall value of creative placemaking generally and public art specifically in the community. East Lansing's taken some important initial steps. We've got a lot of work left to do, and I look forward to working with many of you in this room uh, over the months and years to come to help see these kind of proposals enacted across the state of Michigan so that we can really make municipal government an ally in the creative placemaking work and specifically around public art and not an adversary. So thanks for letting me uh, talk a little bit this morning, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Yes, and as Nathan mentioned, uh, he has to leave us here today. Um, and so, are there any questions out there? Oh, I was uh, asked, which I didn't do. Um, so, if folks have a question, if they would please approach the mic that Deb is uh, putting in place here, and that we will begin with folks there. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Nethercott, and I'm from Matrix Theater Company in Detroit. And first of all, I want to thank you for solving one of the major problems in our industry, which is no dedicated stream of funding anywhere, uh, which is something that we all struggle with all the time. But I have a question for you about public art. Mm -hmm. And, I, and um, in your presentation, it sounded as though you were only talking about public art as that which is, that which is permanently installed. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, is there any investment in the social capital or relationship building side of public art? That's a great question. And actually, one of the things we did when we adopted our percent for art ordinance uh, and amended the city's existing Arts Commission ordinance was to expand the definition of public art so that we were talking about not just traditional uh, visual arts in the form of sculpture, but a wide variety. So uh, we include digital art, performance art, um, traditional visual arts, really the full scope. Our objective as a council was to give the Arts Commission as much flexibility and leeway as possible to pick those projects, be they permanent or temporary, that would provide the most vitality to the community and not overdetermine the result. We're not just looking for a collection of sculptures, we're looking for unique opportunities to engage the community in a number of forms. And I should also note too that in addition to funding the art itself, there's allocations made in the ordinance so that we can do uh, education around it, uh, marketing around it to really give people a way to interact with that artwork. Um, on a temporary and a long-term basis. So our objective was not to say public art is a euphemism for sculpture, 
but was to say that we want to make this pot of money available and empower our Arts Commission to allocate those funds uh, in a way that will provide the broadest scope possible of investments in public art in all its various forms, up to and including things that could be uh, not even installations, but helping support festivals and art classes and things like that that are actually getting people into the mix and getting their hands dirty with public art. That's a great question, though. Uh, uh, yeah, and if you could just share your name and where you're from before okay. asking the question, thanks. Catherine Zudek, I'm from Past the Hat Promotions in Ann Arbor. And my question was, is the university construction project, do they, are they covered under the ordinance? That's another good question. Um, they're not covered under our ordinance um, <laughs> because the university is governed separately by the Board of Trustees. They're a separate constitutional entity, but in fairness to the university, uh, they have their own public art requirement for all construction done on MSU's campus, which is actually one half of 1%, and they go through a very similar process. And we're actually at the point now where, because they're doing it as a university and we're doing it as a community, but we really are one community overall, there's coordination between their public art committee and the city to try and figure out uh, how do we collaborate on those things. And one thing that I'm particularly proud of in that regard, that we're, there's still some kinks, so I don't want to oversell it. Uh, but we're using Bluetooth beacon technology on many of our pieces of public art in the downtown to create a mobile app that'll be both in the city and on campus. So a visitor or a resident can come into downtown, they can download the 517 Art Walk app, they can physically walk around downtown and on campus, and when they, when they get within the proximity of a piece, it'll pop up on their phone, here's the artwork, here's some information about it, uh, at some point, we hope to expand it so that there can be things like video and audio clips that explain the artwork and the artist's own words. And that will be not just on the uh, city side of Grand River Avenue, but also on the university side with their massive collection of public art that they've built. But the money doesn't mangle yet. The, the money, I, I, to be completely honest with you, I don't anticipate a point ever where there's just one pot, but I think that kind of close collaboration will give us an opportunity potentially to jointly fund some projects in the future and whatnot, but I don't see the university giving away their autonomy to make those decisions, or the city, frankly, but I think it's not necessary. As long as we're collaborating together so that where there's opportunities to work together, that's happening. It's not siloed. I think we can accomplish much the same thing without dealing with that tricky jurisdictional issue. Good morning. Good morning. Um, is this on? Okay. Um, I'm Melissa Milton Tong. I'm from Washtenaw County here in Ypsilanti, as well as the Arts Lands Board. Um, my table really liked the concept of um, looking further into perhaps reactivating our percent for art program here in the county. Um, we had one in Ann Arbor. Yeah. You're aware of the situation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're also interested in the idea of not necessarily choosing art that is entirely popular with everyone. Yeah. Our question is, what is your selection process? What's the review process? Process, process, process. I work in government. Um, how can you cut through that? Yeah, um, so let me talk about the process piece first. We have, uh, for many years, have had an arts commission in East Lansing and an arts selection panel. And the way our process normally works for most pieces, especially major installations, is that the city will let an RFP, uh, we will take artist submissions for it, the art selection panel, rather than being just residents uh, who have been appointed because they're interested, they're actually selected because they have some background uh, in the arts and culture. Many of them are practicing artists themselves. They're either sculptors or painters or art history professors. They have some subject matter expertise. Now, well, actually, the, the intention, uh, the question was, for those of you who might not hear us, do you politicize the process? The intention of having the art selection panel is to depoliticize it by letting subject matter uh, experts or people with some experience, not necessarily in the aesthetic judgment, because that's subjective to a certain extent, but knowledge about how the process works, uh, what the various media that are available are. We defer to them. The Arts Commission then takes the recommendation from the Arts Selection Panel, and they make a recommendation to council, but we essentially defer to their judgment about the artistic merit of a given, given piece, and then we deal with the financial side of things. So our council is not making a political decision. Is this popular? Is this not? Um, we're not putting it up for a popular vote, because as I said, using the Qureshi piece as an example, um, at least I am personally not afraid to cause a little controversy with public art, because I think that's what it's designed to do. It's not supposed to be something that is regressing to the mean and just something that makes everything happy and that we can call pretty. So um, that's not always a popular opinion. 
Um, I still get blowback from the Qureshi piece today, but I think on balance it's been very good for our community, and we've had a very strong arts commission and arts selection panel that's helped explain that to the city and work with them um, and really get people bought into the idea that public art is important and it doesn't require that everybody like every piece. Great. And we have two more minutes, just to let everybody know. Yeah, okay. I'll be faster. <laughs> Great. Um, Tammy Salisbury, I'm with Paint Creek Center for the Arts in Rochester, Michigan. And I have a two-part question. Um, first, um, did you benchmark from other communities with the ordinance? Was there, is there anything else you can point to, or were you the pioneers? So um, these ordinances, for whatever reason, are, as I said, we're the only active. Ann Arbor used to have one. Uh, they don't any longer. East Lansing now is the only municipal one in Michigan. But elsewhere in the country, they're extremely common. So there are hundreds of examples out there. When I was writing this ordinance, uh, I reviewed over 150 of them to pick and choose pieces that I thought would best match what worked for East Lansing. So our ordinance is unique in the sense that it's not identical to anyone else's, but there is tons of research available. And in fact, I would point to, there's a report from Los Angeles County that is a fantastic compilation of every percent for our ordinance that's in all of LA County. There's over 80 examples in there, where in one document you can read through all of them, and it's a great starting point. Okay, great, and then just one other um, quick one. How was it received by the development community? Um, so initially with some skepticism, obviously, but I think again, when you, we, the compromise with the cap and explaining that they would have options really went a long way to ameliorating the concerns that they would have. And in the end, there was no vocal opposition from developers once things were explained. I will t that took a great deal of work on my part in particular, going, meeting with them, explaining it, going through the options, talking about the cap. And in the end, um, we even had some developers come on board and say, this is important. It'll help us make sure that there's a process for us to do this. And uh, we may not love the fact that it's going to cost us more money, but there's a, there's a fairness element to it. So um, were they thrilled? No. But did they come around in the end? Absolutely. Well, and thank you, and I apologize, I apologize, but we, uh, we have a jam-packed schedule today, but want to take a minute and, and say, you know, thank you to Nathan for his time here today, and uh, trust me, he's really, he's great on, on email and in social media, so make sure to, if you have other questions, please follow up with him there, um, and we can make sure to get you his contact information, so. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.